So I am, well, like, I'm Theo, and I will be presenting the Viola Jones algorithm, which is an approach for facial detection. Nowadays, if you think about, hi, hey, if you think about facial detection, you will just want to use deep learning. But like, we will be looking at a very famous old approach that actually has some very, very nice insight. So it has been serving as an inspiration to a lot of new like, machine learning methods, and it has been using as pre-processing like, pre techniques um, in machine learning pipelines. But to put it in a nutshell, what we want is, given an image like this, we want to be able to divide the image up in sub-windows and check if there is a face in one of them. And of course, we want to do that for multiple sub-window sizes to account for like, different, um, like, different sizes of faces. So how do we do this? Well, we, of, of course, we start with um, some theoretical background. And there's a very important concept here, uh, which is, well, stronger together. But um, in machine learning, there's this method called ensemble learning that actually uses this idea. Intuitively, what we are doing is the following. We use multiple models that do the job badly, and we put them together to do the job well. Um, and to give a more formal definition, in statistics and machine learning, ensemble methods use multiple algorithms to obtain better predictive performance than could be obtained from any of the constituent learning algorithms alone. And this usually involves some kind of voting. So, and in fact, it's gonna be some kind of weighted voting because not all the models perform the same and some are better, some are worse, and we want to uh, like, uh, cater for that. One of the um, really, really um, like, uh, widely used methods is called boosting. Um, and it's still the problem of ensembling. So informally, this problem asks whether we can, like whether if we have an efficient learning algorithm that outputs a hypothesis, uh, which means a model whose performance is only slightly better than a random guessing, uh, so what we call a weak learner, whether like, the existence of this kind of uh, like algorithm implied the existence of an efficient algorithm that can output hypotheses of arbitrary accuracy. And actually, we would usually want it to be of very high accuracy, i.e. a strong learner. Um, so that's the problem of boosting. And we are going to look at a way to solve it that is really widely used called Adaboost. But before looking at that, let's put some context. Uh, let's say we get um, a set of 1,000 images, and we want to see which ones contain elephants. Um, so this is a binary classification problem. And we would put a label like the positive samples as 1 and negative samples as minus 1. So that's really simple. And we define the training samples as a tuple of xi, so th in this case, this will be the image, and yi, which will be the label, which can be either 1 or minus 1. And we define the weak classifier as just some arbitrary function that outputs 1, that takes in the image and outputs 1 if it, the classifier thinks that it's an elephant, or sorry, that it contains an elephant, or minus 1 otherwise. And what we want to get at the end is some sort of iterative process of t steps such that we basically choose readily like the best um, weak classifiers and uh, like one by one and um, combine them together in some way. And actually we will be using a weighted voting scheme so that we combine them together and get a strong classifier. And in our case, um, like the alpha, the, the alphas here will like correspond to some sort of a voting power. Um, and what we do is that we just sum them together and take the sign. So that's really straightforward. Um, and so how exactly does this work? Right. Um, well, if you look at here, we, get, like, we have like, a bunch of like, data. And the data points are basically just images um, of like, what, like, containing elephants or not containing elephants. Um, what we want to do is to assign each data point a weight which would correspond to like, the weight of that data point in the computation of the error when we choose the, like, the weak classifier. We initialize the weights to be the same thing because we don't know like, what data points would be misclassified or not. And we train a bunch of those weak classifiers we have um, and choose the one with the lowest error, which we would call H1 with error E1. And 
if we look at the misclassified samples of that H1, um, we would basically uh, try to, like in the next iteration, try to emphasize the importance of the misclassified samples and uh, like, uh, like decrease the importance of the um, like correctly classified samples so that the next classifier we choose to, like, will basically cater for that and then try to uh, come up with something that will uh, like get the misclassified samples by the first one classified correctly. And so we update the weights in the way I just described and we get a second classifier. Um, and we repeat that t times so that we get t um, wing classifiers and we want to combine them together. Um, like, and so at each iteration step, we want to devise a weight, uh, so it's some sort of a voting power for each classifier and we want to combine them together at the end to output our strong model. Now, this thing um, is like intuitively very straightforward, but this leaves a couple of questions unanswered and I will attempt to answer them. The first one will be, how do we compute the error rate? Well, it's actually very straightforward here. The error will just be the sum of all the weights uh, that are wrongly classified, like of, of samples that are wrongly classified. Um, and in our case, we can, like, uh, like we can just like ignore the term, the denominator here, because uh, like we try to make the weights normalized so, like, so that they sum up to one. That's just because it's convenient mathematically. Um, and then how do we perform the weight updates? So how do we update the weights each time so that we amplify the importance of the misclassified samples? Now, uh, this involves some more complex mathematics. Um, and when Shapira and Freund in 1995 have uh, created this algorithm, uh, they wanted that the overall error stays on the, like an exponentially decaying bound. And to do so, they proved that we could use this kind of weight update scheme to um, basically achieve that goal. And in, like, I'll try to give an intuitive under, like, uh, explanation of this. Basically, if you look at the term we multiply for like, correctly classified and misclassified samples, we can see that we multiply it by a, like, e to the minus alpha t, which, and this thing would be smaller than one if, uh, because like, alpha t would be positive, um, and e to the minus alpha t would be something smaller than one, e to the plus alpha t would be something bigger than one. So what we're doing is just we're giving a bigger weight to misclassified samples and a smaller weight to correctly classified samples, and we normalize the whole thing. So it's actually quite simple. Um, and finally, how do we compute the voting power we give to each weak classifier? Well, like at each step, we want to add a new like, a weak classifier in. And this would affect the, like, the error of the overall ensemble. And uh, the error can be expressed in this way, and we want to minimize that error at each step. So um, actually, with some like, very simple mathematics, you would be able to derive that this thing is actually bounded, in our case, by the normalizing factor I just uh, mentioned previously. And so what we want to do is just um, to uh, minimize the normalizing factor at each iteration to minimize the overall training error. And if we recall like, that normalizing factor is just calculated by the, uh, the sum over i of like, the, all, the, uh, like, the weights, sorry, all the new weights, and we just uh, use some very simple calculus, um, basically like partial derivative and then like, uh, like make it equal to zero, we get that alpha t will be equal to half of like, natural logarithm of this thing. And this will be like the weight we will put to uh, like each of our each of our weak classifiers. Um, well, like all of these mathematics is really complicated and not really intuitive. But like what's actually really like um, interesting is that if you work through the mathematics, you'll see that um, what we get at the end is just reweighting uh, like uh, the uh, correctly classified samples and re like the misclassified samples. Uh, in like a half-half split, where we just weight the correctly classified samples as like uh, like accounting for like a half of the total weight, and the, like the misclassified sample will also like account for like half of the total weight. And usually, if we get a uh, if we have like properly like weak classifiers, we would get something uh, like an accuracy that's a bit higher than the half. So you would normally get like more samples here than here, and in this case, we would be able to basically. 
um, make the correctly classified samples lower and the incorrectly classified samples higher. So if we put everything together, it actually just gives a very simple algorithm in a sense. Given the training data and a set of weak learners, we would be able to just devise with this method um, a set of, oh, sorry, like we would be able to create a strong classifier uh, with this method. And uh, if we look at the final classifier, like the form of it, like I, I've written it in a like rather different form, but it's, it means the same thing. It's just like computing a sum and then looking at the threshold. And if it's bigger than it, uh, it's a po like we classify it as positive. Otherwise, we classify it as negative. Um, and so, right, that's really straight forward, I think, and, um, but like the problem is, how does this method of combining like weak classifiers and putting them together to create a strong classifier relate to the problem we are supposed to talk about today, which is detecting faces? Well, um, let's, I think let's first present what the problem actually is. So facial detection is actually a very difficult problem because Faces have a lot of variations that are like ethnical or um, like age variations, gender variations, and also there are a lot of variations in terms of the environment in which the image is taken, um, and that might create a lot of false negatives. And also, this like we are trying to uh, like look at sub windows and say, okay, this is a face, this is not a face but we would need to discriminate the faces from anything that's not a face. And that might create a lot of false positives because we are looking at faces that are in the wild, as they say it. As I said previously, nowadays we would just say, okay, let's use deep learning, let's not think about it. But back in 2001, um, in the days where you couldn't just use deep learning because you don't have enough compute power, um, and uh, like the best consumer level chip is a like stunning single core 700 megahertz Pentium 3, um, you would probably need like a bit more thought on this problem. Um, at that point, there were previous approaches that are based on like, uh, like motion, i.e. like the previous frame and the next frame in the video to see that if the face changes in a particular way, then we think that it's a face. Um, and you also have color-based like ones which are based on sin, like uh, face, face color, sorry, like the skin color. Um, and uh, but those ones aren't that robust to a lot of changes and like different face, facial like uh, different facial expressions or different skin colors and stuff. Um, and also, if you look at more comp like uh, more complex geometric approaches that exist at the time, they are good, but. They, um, like they require a lot of time to compute and it's not very good. Um, like you can't get real-time performance, basically. So what we want is something that can get, give real-time performance, but that doesn't use any additional information apart from a grayscale image. And that's exactly how Viola Jones, um, like what Viola Jones uh, solves. So in 2001, Viola jo and Jones have created this uh, machine learning approach uh, which is basically the first robust real-time face detector, as its name in, like, indicates. Even nowadays, if, if like, you use a cheap camera, like, you will probably use like, uh, Viola Jones to detect the face because it's actually really cheap and runs really fast. To give you an idea, it runs at 15 frames a second on a Pentium 3 at 700 megahertz, which is remarkable. But let's break this idea down. So. Um, if we like, just as a reminder, we would like we will not be like looking at the whole image at, like at one point. We want to divide this image into sub windows, so that basically the pro problem becomes given a 24 by 24 sub window. By the way, 24 is a complete arbitrary here. It's just chosen by Viola and Jones. Um, given a sub window like that, does this sub window contain a face? And so, okay. How do we solve this problem? <coughs> there are three major contributions in Viola and Jones' algorithm, and we will look at them like one by one. Um, so the first contribution is uh, the features. Basically, uh, not like deep learning methods today where we just directly use pixel values as inputs, um, like pixel, uh, like one single pixel can only encode a very limited amount of information. So we need something that's more clever, basically, to encode more information. And in maths, we, it happens that we have this kind of wavelet functions um, that look like square waves called Haar wavelets. 
And if we use them as basis functions, we can basically model any finite function as a linear combination of those kind of functions. It works a bit like Fourier series. Um, and if we extend that to two dimensions, we will get features like A and B. And if we extend that idea further, we can get features like C and D, which have three and four rectangles instead of two. And uh, the spirit here is just basically the feature value will be uh, the sum of the pixel value of the values of the gray rectangle minus the sum of the pixel values of the white rectangle. So it's actually quite simple, but you would think maybe it's quite an arbitrary feature and like what can it encode? Well, if you look at some of the example, uh, some of the um, like hard like features as we call them that have been learned from the classifier at the end, you'll see that they actually make sense to an extent. Uh, if you look at the first feature here, uh, it actually encodes some sort of a difference between what's like the area that contains your eye and the area that contains uh, like what's under your eye, so like just skin and like your nose, et cetera. And usually your eye will be darker than your skin. So if you compute the difference, it would be significant in a sense. And the other one is actually also quite interpretable because if you look at that, you'll see that you have like two, like two rectangles that are basically like where your eyes are and then like there's the strip in the middle that basically encodes for like whatever is in the middle of your two eyes. And so basically uh, these features in this sense are actually quite useful. But the problem is to compute them, it's actually not that cheap because we need to uh, compute the, uh, the sum of every pixel in, this, in these rectangles. So we need a, like a more clever approach to do that. And Viola and Jones have come up with this idea of the integral image where basically each cell will be the sum of pixel values of the rectangle from the top left to that cell in the original image. And this makes it really easy to compute any arbitrary rectangles as shown by the picture on the right because we can just do some, a couple of like additions and subtractions and it's done. So it's constant cost and it's really, really fast. But there is another advantage to that because usually we would need to scan, like when we get the detector, we would need to um, like scale the images up or down so that we count for different sizes of faces on the images. But here, instead of scaling the images, which would be really expensive, uh, at least at that time, we can, what we can do is basically to like, scale the detect detector because the features we are using, as you can see like intuitively, they are quite generalizable. Um, and also, uh, with the integral image, like whatever the size of the subwindow is, whatever the size of the rectangle, you would just need constant counts. So it's a way of computing that really, really easily. But there is another problem to that feature. Uh, and it's just that like, if you look at all the possible combinations of those rectangles, two rectangle features, three rectangle features, and four rectangle features in a 24 by 24 subwindow, so it's actually a really small subwindow, you'll get more than 160,000 possible features. And it's just not really feasible to use all of them. Um, but if you think about it intuitively, there probably are some features that are just not useful at all. So Myel and Jones admitted this hypothesis saying that only a very small subset of features in this feature space will be useful. <coughs> And now what we are facing is not what we had before, but rather uh, like a, quite a difficult problem. It's a feature selection problem. And if you remember from, uh, for like the part one of these, if you remember from last year, supervision work for MLRD, you'll remember this particular question, which is given a reasonable amount of training and test data and a feature set with 10 features, how could you establish which features were the more, most useful? Well, like in this case, we don't have just 10 features, but 160,000, but the fit spirit would be the same. One of the possible answers to that question was basically, uh, you train a model uh, like using one feature, like sorry, you train 10 models, 10 different models, each of them using one of the features, and then you compare the performance. Um, and like the one with like the highest performance will be the feature that will be like most important basically. And so by using this kind of approach or this kind of way of thinking, we have reduced our problem from feature selection to selection of a model with only one feature. And more formally, uh, like this model uh, is basically just a decision tree stump, which basically says, okay, if 
um, our feature value, so the, like the, the difference of the sums, uh, is smaller or greater than some threshold, then we give one, otherwise we give zero. And we can see that this kind of model is just really, really weak, right? But the thing is, if we picture the 160,000 um, features as 160,000 weak models, and we want to try to get the best of them and combine them together to get a strong model. And so if you think about it, it's just something that we have talked about just before um, in the first part. And, we can, and what we can do here is just use a boosting and actually add a boost to solve this problem. And in fact, that's the second contribution of uh, Viola and Jones, which is basically using, use add boost and those particular kinds of models to pick features really, really aggressively, um, like pick the best features and then like get an ensemble classifier at the end that actually does the job well. And in fact, uh, if we look at the result, um, in one of the like big monolithic classifiers, they have trained, boosted classifiers, they have trained with other boost uh, using 200 features. They have achieved a very, very high detection rate, a 95% detection rate. Um, a false positive rate that is reasonable um, a 0.7 seconds uh, like uh, runtime for a like 384 times 288 image, which was quite good at the time, considering that we are in 2001. Um, but the problem is, like, this is good, but just not good enough. Because if you think about it, well, first of all, the 0.7 seconds runtime is just too long for us to get like any type of real like run like, real time. Um, like processing, because this will give something like one or two frames a second. That's just nothing. And um, also, uh, like if you consider the false positive rate here, it's actually like it looks low, but if you think about it, uh, like in any image containing faces, that will be like the negative sub windows, so the sub windows not containing faces, like there will be like much more of them than sub windows actually containing faces. And, if, and also, you will need to scan through the image in multiple scales, so multiple times. And combining all of this, it's, this rate is actually extremely high, and, we, like, and um, it's just not good enough. Ideally, we want like, a false positive rate of around one in a million. So it's just not good enough. But how can we do better? Well, like, that's the third contribution of the Viola and, jo like, of Viola and Jones in this algorithm. And the key insight is really that using smaller boosted classifiers, using less features, you would be able to achieve a, like a higher detection, like a very high detection rate, but at the same time, uh, like you'll have a high po false positive rate. For example, very remarkably, um, you can get a 100% detection rate, but with a 50% false positive rate with uh, like boosted classifiers of only two features and not 10, not 200, but just two. And um, this can be done by using add boost, but add boost like uh, it optimizes for the error, right? So when you get like something like that, what you do is that you tweak the threshold down so that you get a higher false positive rate, but also a higher detection rate because you're letting more things through basically. Um, this is not mathematically sound, but like empirically it works. So like just leave it. Um, and so the idea is really to reject many of the sub-windows uh, while detecting most of the positive instances. And you'll, like, you'll ask me, like, how exactly is that useful? Because if you think of that as a classifier, it's just completely garbage because 50% false positive rate is extremely high. But if you think of that not as a classifier but as a filter, then it's actually a very, very cheap filter that achieves a very good performance in filtering out negative windows and in fact, the idea would be to filter out the sub-windows without faces and focus on those containing faces um, and like basically focus your attention on those sub-windows that will actually potentially contain faces. And from this idea, we extend this idea to come to the third contribution, which is what's called attention cascades. Those are just basically a set of <coughs> strong boosted classifiers. So one, two, three, those are strong boosted classifiers in a degenerate decision tree. So each one uh, is optimized to give a high detection rate and at the same time have moderately high like false positive rate. So what we do is that basically we get, like when we get a sub window, we like look uh, the first classifier looks at it. It says okay, this 
doesn't contain a face, then we just throw it away. If it, like, if it thinks it do probably does contain a like, face, we move on to the second phase, uh, sorry, we move on to the second classifier, and so on and so forth. And so basically, with that approach, we are able to filter out the negative windows and very quickly focus our attention on the like, potential positive windows um, really quickly. And um, because only the faces go through the whole pipeline, and uh, the negatives usually get filtered out really like, early, this actually gives a very, very high speed up. But the thing is, like, if you think, uh, and sorry, so if you think about that, that's actually really clever. But like, how would you train such a cascade? Well, um, what you do is basically, um, I think the main spirit is to say that, okay, uh, like when you are say on like when you want to train this like the, the classifier on the second stage, you only want to look at the false positives that go through the whole pipeline. Sorry, that go through the first stage. So the first stage think that it's like it's positive, like it's just negative, and then you um, and then like you want the second classifier to be able to like classify that correctly, and uh, you do that for every stage. So basically, what you do is you set an overall target maximum false positive rate for the whole classifier. And for each state, you, like, you set a maximum false positive rate you can accept and a minimum detection rate you want. At, like, and based on each stage when you train them, you use the same set of positive samples because you, uh, because you would expect all the positive samples to go through anyways. And you want to use a different set of negative samples each time, uh, where basically each time you, so like, you have a big, big set of negative samples because you just have like, so much more like, training data with negatives. Um, and you only want those negative samples that go through all the like, previous stages um, and like, are misclassified by the previous stages so that in the current stage we can reject it. And so if you think about it, that's actually, that will actually take a very, very long time to train. And in fact, at that time, I think it took three or four weeks to train the whole algorithm, but it did give a very, very good performance because compared to monolithic boosted classifiers, it gave around the same detection rate, but it gave a false positive rate that is much, much lower and actually like acceptable in, as a real-time performance. Um, and using the attention cascade, it amortizes the cost, so it runs 10 times faster, and Using this particular training method I have just described, we, what we do is basically we incrementally throw out the negative samples that are rather easy and can be thrown out earlier, and we focus on the ones that are hard. So what happens in the training process in the like last uh, like classifiers put like sorry in the last stages of the cascade is that when we went like before starting to train that stage, we want to get a bunch of false positives from all the previous stages. But the problem is we would need to go through millions of them before we actually get like say a thousand positive like uh, sorry uh, false positives so that we can use them to, for training. So that's basically it. That's the uh, uh, Viola Jones algorithm. There are a couple of caveats in terms of pre-processing, post-processing, scanning through with different step like step sizes or scanning through like in like with different sub-window sizes. And this algorithm is obviously not perfect. We have uh, some failure modes, like when you have like, faces that are not frontal, where we have like, variations in terms of lighting, when you have occlusion, this model is not robust enough for that. Um, but nevertheless, this algorithm has provided a lot of insights and like, has basically in itself made uh, like, people think that facial detection in real time is actually possible because it's the first one that actually has done that. Um, and so if you look at the recent advances of in facial detection, which I would like, on which I would like to conclude my talk, uh, you'd, you will see that like, we get better results usually because we have more data and more compute power with Moore's law. Um, we develop constantly better features like histogram histograms of oriented gradients, and that's from 2005, so it's actually quite old. And we just get have better models, which we can now afford to compute like deep learning models, such as like cascade CNNs. But those models, some of them are actually like have bits and pieces that are still inspired from the Viola Joe's algorithm. Because um, say, for example, in, like in this particular case, um, the, like, the, the approach is basically to uh, like run it through a cascade of 
convolutional neural networks, and then refine the like the windows you want to look at, uh, like uh, little by little. So like focus your attention on the windows that actually might contain a face, which and then, and so that's uh, like in the sense uh, like inspired from Viola and Jones. Um, right. So thank you very much for listening. Here are my references. If you want to, um, like. Yeah, if you want to just like search up things or like read more. Right, thank you.